Well, we've got a, uh, a good sermon this morning. I love the gospel, the epistle of 1 John. We're going to be there for a few weeks leading up to Pentecost. And so uh, if you'd like to read some of that in your devotional time, it, that wouldn't hurt you at all. So uh, 1 John, we're going to be here for a little bit. Get this thing here to... There we go. I want to give you just a quick introduction. I mean, when I say quick, it's going to be quick. Jumping into this book, in 70 AD, after several years of fighting, the armies of Rome completely conquered the Holy Land, destroying the city of Jerusalem and its temple in the process. So have that in mind. This has all gone on before John writes this epistle. Shortly prior to that, the Christian population fled. Many went east across the Jordan. John the Apostle was part of a group that eventually went to the Roman province of Asia where he settled in Ephesus. That's where he's writing this portion of this letter. Ephesus was a large commercial city with a deep heritage of paganism and a reputation for being a center of magic and the occult. The church in Ephesus had been founded in A.D. 52 by the Apostle Paul. He served there for several years and had a wide-reaching ministry. For a time in the 60s, Paul's helpers, Timothy, acted as his representative over the church. Look at this. This is very interesting. John probably wrote his three New Testament letters and his gospel while in Ephesus, somewhere between 85 and 95 A.D. I'm going to stop there just for a moment. John would have been probably in his 90s when he's writing this. He is the only living apostle at this time. All the other 11 have died. He's the only living apostle at this time, even outliving the apostle Paul. In fact, church history tells us that they used to bring him in when he was too old and he couldn't walk, and they would carry him in, and there'd be large groups gathered under a tree or in a cave, some house church, and they'd bring John in, and they'd, all, they'd be packed out. They wanted to hear the apostle John, who actually walked with Jesus. And they'd bring him in, and this crowd would all be quiet, and they'd sit him down, and he would say, Beloved, love one another. And they'd carry him out. And they said, John, why do you speak so little? He said, well, if they'll do that, their lives will come together. <laughs> love one another. So this is the apostle John who's writing this. And here, here's, here's an idea. A good guess for Revelation, also written during that period, is about A.D. 96. He's on the Isle of Patmos when he writes that. And then certainly the elder, John, must have remarkable influence, being the only one of the original 12 left alive by this time. Nonetheless, it appears that there was at least one group of, that separated from the aged apostle and his teaching. I want to dip into this for just a moment. These were precursors of those who would later be called Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, -S, Gnostics, a large and diverse heretical movement that would remain strong for the next several centuries. And if you understand this group, it will really, really help you to understand this little epistle. These Gnostics, a group of these dissidents apparently split off from the main body of the Asian church. So here's Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a heresy, that means false teaching, that was rampant in the Roman Empire from about the second century. Its name came from the Greek word knowledge or gnosis, the G is silent. The Gnostics believed that knowledge was the way to salvation. For this reason, Gnosticism was condemned as a false and heretical by several writers of the New Testament. The Gnostics consisted of diverse groups from high-minded ascetics to licentious charlatans. Here's the idea. All matter, all stuff we can touch in the physical, all matter is evil. Only the spirit is good. So Gnostics were coming into the church and they were teaching that Jesus was a phantom because if Jesus literally had flesh and bones as we do, that he would be evil. But really he was just a phantom. And his spirit, the spirit of God was upon him, came upon him at his baptism, they would say, and then left him before he went to the cross. This group was coming into the church, infiltrating the church and spreading all kinds of rumors, all kinds of heresy within the church. And they were saying, our bodies are evil. That's all we can do is do evil but our spirits are good. So I can go and unite myself with a prostitute. My body is doing that dirty deed, but my spirit is still good. See that heresy? See how crazy that is? So there's some saying, I've never sinned because, well, my spirit is always good. I've never done anything wrong. It was my body. It's matter. It's evil. But my spirit has been good. You say, boy, that's a crazy thought, isn't it? How could people believe that? Well, look in the pew today. 
that people say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just human. I'm going to sin. I'm going to sin all the time. I can't help it. I'm just going to sin, sin, sin. And God says, no. No, I've given you the Spirit of God to rest in you, to help you, to walk holy with me. We're not talking about perfectionistic living. We're not talking about perfectionism. We're talking about Christ-like living. Christ-like living. This Gnosticism was creeping in, and it was awful. In response, John wrote this letter to the believers who were still part of the, the circle and remained faithful. The tone of the letter indicates that they had a personal connection with him, and his goal was to establish them in their faith, encourage them to abide in it, and discourage them from bear, or buying into the erroneous beliefs of the dissidents. That's a big job. So here's a quick overview. Look at these, these contrasts. He writes about love and darkness. You're going to see that. He writes about truth and falsehood, love and hate, sin and righteousness, death and life, and Christ and Antichrist. John writes about the Antichrist four times in this little epistle. So 1 John, no darkness in God or his believers. No darkness in God or in his believers. So we're going to look at that together here. This first verse that we're looking at, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, the ears, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. He's fighting directly against this heresy of Gnosticism. If he's a phantom, you can't touch him. So they're saying, no, Jesus was raised bodily. He had a real body, flesh and blood. He ate the broiled fish. Uh, we read this story last night in our family devotions, and, and I said to my kids, I said, you know, he ate the fish and it didn't fall out the bottom. He wasn't a ghost. He actually contained and held on to the food he ate. He was a spiritual body at that time. So John is fighting against this heresy. And if you have people around you saying, well, Jesus wasn't really human. He was just God. Eh, time out. No, 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 no. First John is writing about this very strongly. It's very important to our faith. Jesus said, Behold, my hands and my feet, that is, I myself, handle me, Thomas, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and blood, as we see me have. He had a body. Remember what Thomas said? Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put, your, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Now, I don't know. I, want to, I wish I could have been there to see that. I don't know if Thomas actually went over and went, uh, I don't know, let me see. Or if he just was like, Oh, there's Jesus standing before me. And he bowed down in his presence and he said, my Lord and my God. I don't know what he did. I imagine he probably just fell down. I don't think he needed any more proof than that. But then Jesus said, blessed are those who do not see me and believe. That's you. That's me. We have not seen him with a natural eye, but we believe by the testimony that we have, by the word of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that bears witness in our hearts that he is the son of God. And this is interesting. He, John talks a lot about these things in his little epistle. And so I'm going to hit a few of them here. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. That's his testimony. We have seen and testified. I said this last week, most people don't die for a lie. But they will die for the truth. These men, except for John, were all martyrs for their faith. This life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. The life. What's the life? Jesus. The Logos. The Logos, the Word of God, the breath of God. Jesus appeared. We've seen, testified, proclaimed to the eternal life. This is what he's doing. And when you're in this place today and you're hearing these words go out, your faith is being strengthened. Your heart is being lifted. You're getting good teaching, good doctrine. I commit to you that I will preach to you from the Word of God. I will not preach to you my best ideas because they're not that great. But the Word of God is awesome. It's powerful. And if you'll listen to this, it will change your life. It'll revolutionize the way you think. It'll help your marriages. It'll help you raise your kids. It'll help you know how to pray for your grandkids. It'll, it'll teach you how to even be a better student, kids. If you'll follow the Word of God, it'll, it'll teach you how to be a better student. I'm telling you, this is a very practical book. <laughs> we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. There it is again. He's talking about the physical, touching, empirical proof, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this. Here's one of His purposes. We write this to make our joy complete. Huh. H how is that? H how do you get complete joy? Where is joy found? 
Well, it's not in unbelief. Voltaire was an infidel of the most pronounced type, and he wrote, I wish I had never been born. <laughs> Where's joy found? Not in pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure, if anyone did. He wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Where's joy found? Not in money. Jay Gould, the American millionaire, had plenty of that. When dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Where is joy found? It's not in position and fame. Lord Beaconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both. He wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, and old age a regret. Where is joy found? It's not in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world of his day. Having done so, he, he wept in his tent and he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Where then is real joy found? The answer is simple, in Christ alone. Our joy is found in Christ alone. You can go and you can listen to all kinds of comedies and you can listen to all kinds of jokes and think you're going to make your heart happy and joyful. That'll be passing. True joy comes from knowing Jesus Christ. And, and you know how you know him? You obey him. You obey him, and then you know him. Then you know him, and then you obey him. It's a cycle. You know him, you obey him. You know him, you obey him. And John's going to talk about that. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. Hmm. How is that even possible? Because light dispels darkness. Darkness is powerless to stop the light. You ever been in a cave and it's really dark and you strike a match or turn on a lighter or a flashlight? Nowadays, we just turn on our cell phone. And light dispels the darkness. Jesus is this light that's come into the world dispelling the darkness. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you, the psalmist said. This is from Daniel 2.22. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. He knows what's under your ribcage. He knows what's between your ears. God knows everything. In fact, you can't hide anything from him. He knows what you're thinking before you think it. He knows what you're going to say tomorrow. He knows what you're going to do. God knows all things. There's nothing outside of his knowledge. And he loves you. He knows me better than anybody, and he loves me more than anybody. I, I, think, I don't think I would love myself that much because I know all my foibles, my frailties, my wrinkles, my warts. I know me. And you know you. And you wonder sometimes, how could anybody really love me like that? But God does. God loves you through it all. <laughs> so no secrets. No secrets. The Christian life should have no secrets, no secret sin, no secret thoughts, no secret. You say, what about a birthday party? Well, that's just privacy. That's not secrecy. But I'm talking about dark, evil sin, that there should be no secrets in the life of a Christian because Jesus is light. And when he comes in, he dispels the darkness. There should be no secret thoughts in you, no secret desires to do something harmful. If there are, just confess them to the Lord. Don't hide them. Don't get in a cave somewhere and say, no, I'm not like that. Confess those things to the Lord that you might be healed. Only God lives forever, and he lives in light and that no one can, can come near. No human has ever seen God or can see him. God will be honored, and his power will last forever. Amen. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. This is what Jesus spoke to them. He said to his disciples, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There was a lady that came to me and she said, uh, Pastor, you need to come talk to my brother. This is in another state. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, he says he's got a call to preach. And I said, well, that's great. She said, no, it's not. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, my, my brother, he's, he's, he's still smoking every day and he's getting high on the weekends he drinks and he gets drunk and he beats his wife occasionally. And she said, I talked to him and I said, brother, you say you've got a call to ministry. You, you're living like the devil. He said, hey, sis, don't judge me. And she fell mute and she came to me and she said, what do I tell him? 
And I said, well, tell him to go into the ministry. No, I didn't. I didn't tell him. I said, I said, I said let's talk to him. And so we went through some of these scriptures in 1 John. I went with, his name was Marcus. I went through some of these scriptures with Marcus. And I said, Marcus, you know, you've got to live in the light. You can't live in secrecy and darkness and sin. He goes, well, who gave you the authority to tell me? And I said, I'm glad you asked. God did. God says it in his word that if we say we walk with God, we cannot continue to walk in darkness or else we are a liar in that. Again, we're not talking about perfectionistic tendencies or perfectionism. We're talking about that you're walking in the light, okay? If we claim, this is, I'm a Christian. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. You get a Pinocchio. Have you heard about this in the Wall Street Journal and these different ones? They, they give out Pinocchios, or maybe it's not the Wall Street Journal. It's one of these newspaper articles. They give out Pinocchios. And if politicians lie, they give them like one Pinocchio, two Pinocchios, four Pinocchios. I heard that there's some that got four Pinocchios the other day. That's the worst you can do. So if you claim, you say, I am a Christian, and then you continue. If I continue to walk in darkness, I am a liar. That's what he's getting at. And it's not to make you mad. It's not to drive you out. It's not to say you're out of here, you're no good. But whenever you hear those words, it makes you think, oh, Lord, please help me not to be a Pinocchio. Help me not to be a liar. Help me to walk in the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his son purifies us from all sin. Walking. Remember, this is not a sit of faith. This is a walk of faith. We keep walking. I don't care how old you are. You can be 104 as a Christian, you keep walking. doesn't mean physically, it means spiritually. You keep walking with him. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening, that we walk with God. Enoch, he walked with God, and then he was no more, for the Lord took him. Someone said that at the end of the day, when they got so far down the road, God said, Enoch, we're a lot closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come on home with me? And he did. Enoch was gone. He walked with the Lord. Are you walking with the Lord? Are you walking with him? Is he outpacing you on your way back because you're holding on to something? Are you mad? You've got a grudge. You're angry. Ah, oh, somebody hurt you. And you're walking behind light. I'd say, no, no, no. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And when you do that, guess what happens? He cleanses you. He continually cleanses. That's the idea in the Greek. It's all the time he cleanses you. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Why do sinners not want to come to Christ? For the same reason that criminals don't go looking for a police officer. <laughs> right? Right here, Jesus said, it's the idea that they're afraid that their deeds will be exposed. But he already knows what you're doing. You may as well come to him and talk to him about it. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So if we claim, here it is again, if we profess, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. I thought we're a holiness church. We are. I thought that God gave us the power to, to walk with him and not have to sin every day. And, and then John says this, if we claim that we're without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Who's he writing to? The Gnostics who say, I can live as I want in my body and I don't sin. He's talking to the Gnostics. So if you're of that persuasion, he's saying, no, you can't go on living like that and calling yourself a Christian. You are living in sin. You must admit that sin, confess that sin, turn from that sin. There's a story from the Better Business Bureau. A school teacher lost her life savings. Think about that, school teachers. A school teacher lost her life savings in a business scheme that had been elaborately explained by a swindler. With her investments disappearing and her dream that was shattered, she went to the Better Business Bureau. Why on earth didn't you come to us first, the official asked. Didn't you know about the Better Business Bureau? Oh, yes, said the lady sadly. I've always known about you, but I didn't come because I was afraid you'd tell me not to do it. The folly of human nature is that even though we know where the answers lie, God's word, we don't turn there for fear of what it will say to us. Mm. But if we confess our sins, this is good news. This is one of my favorite verses when I'm talking to people that are far from God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Everybody say all. 
How much is all? Yes. He will take care of all your sins. Oh, I've had too many divorces. I've had an abortion. I've looked at pornography. I lie to my boss on a regular basis. If you confess your sins, he will forgive all of your sin. All of it. Well, I've abused people. I've done things. I've done just Doesn't matter. Look at this promise. If we confess, that means to agree with God about our sinful condition. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All of it. Aren't you glad for that? I remember I was working at Sears Outlet when I was in college and uh, I was in ministry classes and I shared this on a Wednesday night. Some, some of you may have heard this, but it fits in so well here. I'm going to force it right back in. And the idea is I was there and, and I was working and, and we had something called Muzak. It's the music that plays throughout Sears. You know, the, the, the elevator music is what it is. And one of my friends said, hey, go in there and turn that music up. And so I went into the dial. It was on like four and it turned up to six. And I ran back out to my aisle where I was working. And my boss, Dennis, ran around the corner. And he's like, that music is loud. And so he went and turned it down. And, and uh, so then my buddy said, hey, go do it again. I'm like, okay. And so then I go back in there and I turn it, I kept the, like, now it's like on seven or eight and it's just loud. And I run back out and I act like I'm working there and Dennis runs around the corner of my boss and he's like, what's going on? And he turns that back down. My buddy say, go do it again. <laughs> okay. Here I am as a 20-year-old doing this stupid shenanigan. And I go back in there, and I turn it up to 10. And it sounds tinny. It's crackling through the speakers. It sounded awful. I mean, it's so loud. And people in the store are cringing. And I run back out, and, I'm, and Dennis runs around. And he turns it down. And he comes out. He looks at me. He says, are you doing this, Noel? And I went, nope. <laughs> and he went, all right, well, tell me if you know who did it. And all of a sudden, I felt the weight. I was like, oh, now I'm embarrassed. Now I've got sin. I've lied to my boss, and so then I don't do anything that day. I go to class the next day to my ministry class. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> I'm just telling you, I need Jesus just like you do. <laughs> and so I'm in my ministry class, and we're talking about confession of sin. I'm like, why today, Lord? <laughs> they go around the circle. What's been your sin? How can we pray for you? And I'm like, oh, Lord, no, it comes to me. What about you? And I'm like, yesterday, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, you did that? And I'm like, yeah. Well, you know what you need to do, don't you? And I said, well, I did already. I, I confessed it to you. I'm done, right? I'm good. And they're like, no. You need to go back and tell your boss. It's like, Are you serious, Clark? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to hold you accountable. We're going to see you tomorrow, Nolds. So you better tell us that you went back and made it right. And I'm like, all right. Man, I felt these huge rocks on my shoulders, sandbags. So I go to work, and I just go right in. Before I even clock in, I just go, and I say, Dennis, I need to tell you something. He's like, yeah, what is it? He's busy. I go, I need to tell you something. I, I made a mistake. He goes, yeah, what is it? I said, I lied to you yesterday. He went, what? I said, ah, the music, loud. He goes, yeah, who was that? I said, it was me. I did that, and I lied to you, and I need to ask your forgiveness. Would you forgive me? He went, yeah, that's fine. Don't do it again. And I left there and I felt these boulders come off of my shoulders. I walked out of there and I went right back over to Muzak and I, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I, didn't. <laughs> I went back to class that next day. And you know what? It was so wonderful to tell him. It's like making your joy complete because you're obeying what God says. That's the idea. The, the joy comes with knowing God and then obeying him, right? How much will he forgive us of? All unrighteousness. How much? How much? That's all of it. If you're a child, you're a teen, you're an adult, you're past senior adult, God will forgive all of your sin. That is good news. Amen? That's good news right there. Wash me thoroughly, David said, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Boy, it's a beautiful prayer. Mud pies. <laughs> there was a soap manufacturer who was an unbeliever, and he walked along the road one day with a preacher of the gospel. Said the soap manufacturer, the gospel you preach has not done much good, for there is still a lot of wickedness in the world and a lot of wicked people too. The preacher made no reply until they passed a dirty little child making mud pies. Seizing his opportunity, the preacher said, Soap has not done much good in the world, I see, for there is still much dirt and many dirty people about. Oh, well, said the manufacturer, soap is only useful when it is applied. 
Exactly, said the preacher. So it is with the gospel that we proclaim. You've got to apply this message. You can hear this sermon. You can go, oh, we love that preacher. He's a good preacher. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't apply it, it doesn't mean anything. You've got to apply this to your everyday life. When you go out in your workaday world, you can't just go and live like the devil and come in here and raise your hands and worship. No, there's got to be a consistency. There's got to be a confession, confessional living with people around you. Again, apply these things and your joy will be made complete. So here it is. If we claim, there it again, if we profess, if we claim, I'm a Christian. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So if you're living in sin, don't say, well, I'm entirely sanctified. I can do those sins and they don't affect me. No, you can't do that. If you claim you're a spirit-filled Christian, you can't go on living in sin, okay? My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Wait a second. I thought you just said we can't claim to be without sin. Now he's saying, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. That's what he's getting at. He's writing this letter to them so that they will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Huh. I need that conjunction right there. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Remember that, Schoolhouse Rock? I learned about the buts there and the ends and the commas. And all. You, you, you say, wait, Jesus, you're writing this through John so that we will not sin. But if somebody does sin, if, it doesn't say when, it says if, if somebody sins, then he can make, he can make restitution for us, okay? I don't know if you heard about the fellow, he was stealing iPhones. He was just, he was picking them up and it was so easy. People leave their cell phones laying around and he was caught. He had stolen many cell phones and he's before the judge and he said, judge, I do confess I've stolen many cell phones. And the judge said, well, we're going to have this for you. And they had all of these things lined out that he had to do. And he had some time he had to do. But he said, I just want to tell you, judge, if you'll just let me go, if you'll just let me go right now, not only will I tell you I'm sorry for all the cell phones that I've stolen, but I'm going to tell you sorry for all the cell phones I'm going to steal in the future. <laughs> That's called presuming on grace. And we don't do that. If we confess our sins, it's not sins out in the future like, God, you know I'm going to sin like crazy, so would you go ahead and forgive me for all those out in the future? No, it's, there's, a, there's an active part that we have that as we confess, he forgives we're not presuming on grace and saying, I can live as I please because I made a commitment to Jesus at an altar. No, you continue to walk. That's a walk of faith. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. I read about a small boy who was consistently late coming home from school. His parents warned him one day that he must be home on time that afternoon. But nevertheless, he arrived later than ever. His mother met him at the door and said nothing. At dinner... That night, the boy looked at his plate, his dinner plate. There was one slice of bread and one glass of water before him. He looked at his father's full plate and then at his father, but his father remained silent. The boy was crushed. The father waited for the full impact to sink in. Then quietly, he took the boy's plate and placed it in front of himself. He took his own plate of meat and potatoes and put it in front of the boy and smiled at his son. When that boy grew up to be a man, he said, all my life I've known what God is like by what my father did that night. Jesus made this great transfer for us. He sacrificed himself. He gave us all of his righteousness, and he took all of our sin upon himself. And if you put your faith in that son of God named Jesus, that's what happens to you. It's the great transaction, the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Friend, have you made that transfer? Have you made that initial walk with him? Have you said, Lord, I want to confess my sin and walk with you? See, there's no darkness in God or in his believers. Oh, maybe it's temporary, but it won't stay. You can't continue to walk in sin. I can't continue to walk in sin. There's no darkness in God, nor is there darkness in his believers. The lady that went to the doctor, the oncologist, cancer throughout her body. The doctor went in and got the cancer from her, went in and he said, ma'am, I've got good news and bad news. Good news is I got most of the cancer. 
I had an appointment later and I had to leave early so I didn't get to get the last 10% of cancer out of your body. Are you okay with this? No. How foolish would that be? God, I want you to take most of my sin. No, take it all. Take every part of me that's not like you, Jesus, and replace it with your goodness and your grace in my life. Do you want that, folks? Do you want that kind of grace to be in you and working through you? I do. I need reminders like this myself. I'm just like you. I'm one beggar showing some other beggars where the bread is. We've got to keep coming back to God's word. The, if our singers could come at this time, worship leaders, I want to read this. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Is that your prayer? I want to ask us to stand if we could.